The topic of SpongeBob SquarePants spin-offs is very polarizing. Ever since the first one was announced a year or two back, we saw a Twitter war erupt, with a group of people denouncing said spin-offs and shaming Nickelodeon for making such a thing. And all there's not thinking it was as big of a deal, and then Nick could do whatever they wanted with the series. I mean, hey, more SpongeBob could only be a good thing, right? <laughs> Wrong! But why were people this upset? What about this sweet little face could possibly cause such backlash? Well, for those unaware, SpongeBob SquarePants was created by a man named Steven Hillenburg. He worked on the series for the first three seasons and very first movie, but after that took a step back to focus on other projects, and also he just created like, the biggest thing ever, I think the dude deserved a break. But anyways, he later returned to work on the show with the release of the second film, Sponge Out of Water. However, this return was short-lived, as Steven sadly passed away on November 26, 2018, due to ALS. The issues came in when just three months later in February of 2019, Nick announced that they would be creating spin-offs to try and widen the Spongebob universe. The problem here? Well, back in the day, Steven Hillenburg was very against the idea of creating spin-offs for the show, even quoting, you know, one of these days they're gonna want to make Spongebob babies. That's when I'm out of here. Yikes. Yeah, so people started getting mad at Nickelodeon for going against the guy's wishes right after he had died, and assumed they had been creating it behind his back, or were waiting for him to die, in order to finally start milking Spongebob for all he's worth. The truth? I don't know. Nobody really does. The only guy who possibly knows what Steven Hillenburg thought or would have thought about these spin-offs was Steven Hillenburg, and we sadly can't ask him to reiterate. You know those quotes were from years ago, who knows if he had changed his mind, or maybe even knew about them and helped with the development of the series. But either way, what boat am I in with this whole debacle? I don't care. A profit-hungry corporation did something shitty, the sky is blue and I'm fucking epic at arcade games. It's shitty if they did go against the guy's wishes, but like, it was sort of inevitable. What I care about most in all this are the shows themselves. Just because Steven may not have wanted them doesn't mean they're gonna be bad. Were they bad? Well, that's what I'm gonna look at today. As with the announcement of not only a fourth theatrical Spongebob movie, but also the reveal of three fucking spin-off Paramount Plus movies, I feel like this is the perfect time to go in-depth with the two currently released Spongebob Squarepants spin-offs, Camp Coral and The Patrick Star Show. Starting with the one that came out first, Camp Coral Spongebob's Under Years. You know, much like Spongebob, I too was a child at some point. Not anymore, though. Mark, go do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, go, 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 go! And something that I know I gotta keep an eye out for is getting rid of my facial hair. That's why I'm so happy that today's video is sponsored by Manscaped.com, who've sent me this massive package filled with many amazing men's grooming products. This video is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for your body. They hooked me up with this all-in-one performance package 4.0. Check it out. It's got the Lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer with waterproof trimmers and advanced skin safe technology. They even sent this wireless nose and ear hair trimmer, deodorant, and look, for a limited time, you can even get all this plus two free gifts. Two! The Shed Travel Bag and Boxer Briefs. So go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts, when you use promo code LSMARK at checkout. And thanks to manscaped.com for sponsoring this video. Now, Camp Coral had a huge marketing campaign behind it. There were sports event promos, merchandise, and it was one of the bigger shows being pushed on the new streaming service, Pyramon Plus. They even decided to dedicate a huge portion of the new SpongeBob movie into promoting it. Now, apparently the idea for the flashback sequences in Sponge on the Run came before the idea of Camp Coral, but when they greenlit the project, I can imagine they decided to insert many more scenes showing Spongebob and friends at camp to get you intrigued in this new setting they've put them in. The other day, I decided to go back and rewatch Sponge on the Run for this video, and by god is it even worse than I remembered. Despite being made by the same crew as the show, for some reason it just doesn't... It just doesn't feel like Spongebob. Everyone is written just a little bit off for the sake of conflict. Spongebob in one scene can be leaving his house, eager for adventure because he's got his best friend hanging around him. A wingman? A friend. Really, Patrick? You'd go with me? Then in the next, argues with Patrick over him being the only hero in this adventure. Like, what's going on? This is gonna be like one of those buddy movies. We're the buddies. <laughs> Not sure that really applies, Patrick. But the worst thing about the film is without a doubt the pacing. The start is way too slow. It takes 20 minutes for the actual plot to kick in. Then they very quickly get to their main goal in like 20 more minutes. Then they fumble around for the last 50, accomplishing nothing. And there is no scene that exemplifies that more than the pre-climax court scene, where to prove Spongebob innocent, all his friends come in and recount memories of meeting him at summer camp. How this proves him innocent for kidnapping Gary, I have no clue, but I digress. Judge, my client may have killed the victim and chopped up his body, but he's a pretty swell guy, trust me. 
I wouldn't have minded this, but with the way it's presented, you know, the whole movie halting, this just came off as a blatant attempt at advertising their new series, and with that, all eyes are on the new show. Could it possibly live up to the hype? No. It's not a good sign when your show opens with a toilet flush sign effect. The trail. <laughs> this series was forgotten about in like a day. Nobody really gave a shit about it except for the people praising the fact that it wasn't a train wreck. And with that, I guess it's time for me to throw my two cents in, and discuss what I thought about it after watching a majority of the episodes. It's just Spongebob in a camp setting. The story of Camp Coral is quite simple. We're just seeing the daily adventures of Spongebob and his friends at summer camp, with each main character from the normal show taking on a different role, with Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy being kids, Squidward as a camp counselor, Mr. Krabs as the camp leader, Plankton as a chef, etc, etc. What you may be asking yourself is something like, hey, didn't Spongebob canonically meet Sandy for the first time in season 1 of the show? Didn't he meet Mr. Krabs for the first time in the first episode too? Weren't Plankton and Mr. Krabs like sworn enemies from childhood but they're friends now in this one? The answer to all this is... Yes. Yes, they were. This was one of the biggest criticisms I saw for the show before and shortly after its release, but honestly this was one of my least biggest concerns coming out of it, because this show has much, much larger issues that need to be addressed. The biggest one of course being... This show has literally no reason to exist. Not as in Spongebob doesn't need a spin-off, no matter how true that may be. But what I mean is that this series does almost nothing to set itself apart from the original. The only difference is the setting. All of the character personalities are almost the exact same. It would have actually been a little interesting if some of the characters acted different. Then over the course of the show, you could see how they ended up the way they did. But no, just about every single character acts the same way as their adult counterpart. The only difference to speak of is that some of the plots are more focused on childlike stuff. Even though all the characters are voiced by their official counterparts, even though in Sponge on the Run they're voiced by babies. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, one of the only episodes that did a good spin on the classic Spongebob formula is the one where Spongebob and Patrick get in trouble with Mr. Krabs and have to spend their time in time out. Reminds me of something like Wet Painters, where they saw him as a big threat. But the difference in writing is that where in that episode it's funny to see just how desperate they get in trying to cover up the fact that they got paint on his dollar because he threatened to basically kill them. But here there really is no threat. Patrick blames Spongebob and therefore he gets punished, but then Patrick tries to get in with him by getting in trouble, then he does and they get released after a bit of banter. Like, there's nothing, there's no conflict here. That's basically how I describe a majority of the episodes in this show. Boring and team. And it's clearly not because of the demographic. Despite being a babyfied version of Spongebob, it's clear that the age market is around the same of the original. It's written the same way. But nothing happens in these episodes, the characters are all just going through the motions. Like the one where Spongebob and Patrick try to help this anchovy find the new personality. There's nothing at stake here, they don't even follow their own rules. Patrick! Pizza's not a personality! Yeah, neither is a chef, but you tried that anyway. There's nothing at stake here, and they don't really accomplish much by the end of it. The whole show just feels like I'm watching 20 episodes of filler. And with the characters all basically being the same as their main counterparts, it brings up the question of why this was even an original series to begin with. There seriously can't be that many unique ideas you can have with the basic concept of Spongebob at camp. So why not just have it be part of the main series for a couple episodes? It's gone on for like 300 episodes at this rate, I think it's safe to say you can afford to switch things up a little. Now that's not to say that I don't attempt to add some new ideas into the show however. Are any of them good? What do you think? Other than a bunch of random NPCs like this ugly bitch, I don't want to look at her. One of the main new secondary characters they added was this girl called Narlene Narwhal, and her brother Nobby. They're annoying. I don't even know if this was intentional though. Like, they do this thing I really hate, where to make you like a character and think they're cool, they simply just have all the characters around them call them cool. In the episode she's introduced, all she does is get the campers addicted to a candy syrup, then when they wreak havoc in the camp she charges Mr. Krabs to remove it from them, basically just scamming him. Once again, where's the fucking conflict? Nothing is happening here. But also, all this does is just make me think this lady's an annoying bitch. Just having Spongebob say, Whoa, she's so cool, at the end doesn't make it fucking true. Marlene is so cool. And so funny. And so... Funnily enough, they actually brought these characters into the main Spongebob series for an episode, where they are just as unfunny and bothersome. But I guess it is a cool idea to cross over characters from each show. They even actually brought back Plankton's family from the early seasons of the original series in the same episode. Although I'm not sure if I want to give them props for that. New Spongebob just seems obsessed with reminding you of the old Spongebob, so that by proxy you'll think the newer ones are good too. Not that they're bad or anything, I just think they're kind of uninteresting. And I did like the brief flashback where we got to see the Camp Coral Spongebob animated in 2D. Oh shit, that's right, the elephant in the room! This show looks like shit!
I mean, it's a bad sign when even the poster for the show has the characters looking unbelievably lifeless. <laughs> if you somehow haven't noticed by now, this show is animated in 3D with CG. And if you know anything about TV budget CGI animation, it doesn't look the best. To give credit where credit is due, there is a lot to like about the way the series looks. I think they mostly shine during nighttime shots, where the light source is made clear and we have nice purples and oranges. And they are very, very ambitious when it comes to how much they stretch and morph these models. But despite all the ambition, I can't help but notice how much its animation is held back by the budgetary issues of TV. Like, I couldn't help but notice how much the characters' eyes clip into each other, or their dimples. And a big problem also has to be how much the animators are trying to match the 2D storyboards. The issue with this is of course how hard it is to replicate how surreal and cartoony 2D Spongebob can get. The second and third movie were able to achieve this as a simple result of them having a much bigger budget. But when done for 2D, it results in a lot of awkward, uncanny looking faces. <laughs> And jokes that aren't as well conveyed because it's harder to get surreal animation when working with models. There has to be some kind of rhyme or reason to everything. And so I can't even appreciate the jokes they're trying to tell, because I have to spend a second going, Oh, okay, that's the joke they're trying to tell. Ha. With them focusing on CGI animation, I feel like this would have been the perfect opportunity to focus more on well-written jokes than simple slapstick or surrealist humor. Like, I get it, it's Spongebob, that's what it's always been. But when you're doing a TV show using 3D animation, it becomes way harder to do those things. So in that regard, if them deciding to make the show 3D did nothing but hinder its quality, then why did they do it at all? Well, it's cheaper. And boy, does it look cheap. It has the same issues as a lot of 3D shows, where at times shots look very unrendered. Reminds me a lot of Sonic Boom, actually, where one episode could look amazing and the other look like dog shit. From what the animators on it have told me, it was due to time limitations, so I can imagine that problem plagued Camp Coral as well. That's not to mention how ugly the overall shading is here. A big problem I have with a lot of shows nowadays is that they use black to shade everything. It makes it look all dark and not very appealing. That's a really bad issue of Camp Coral. This is Spongebob, where are the bright saturated colors? The cool blue sky? Instead we have this piss yellow color. Oh yeah, yum. Seriously, when lit well these characters look great, I can't understand the thought process here. If there's anything else about the animation I can appreciate, it's definitely how much they incorporated different types of mediums such as puppetry, using live action footage at times, and even using 2D animation sometimes. Such as when Sandy talks to her future self from the Mean show, you know, that was neat. But at the end of the day, none of that could have saved the show. By the way, Sandy looks like the fucking chip at from that CG Alvin and Chipmunk show. It's not relevant, I just literally thought of that. But at the end of the day, none of that could have saved the show, because all Camp Coral is is regular current Spongebob. In a camp setting. That, that's it, it's nothing. We had one season of the show air last year, and after looking it up it appears we're getting a second at some point soon, so I can only hope that they improve upon a lot of the stuff I mentioned here. But sadly, a lot of the problems I have with the series is fundamental things they couldn't really change, with the biggest one being how it doesn't do a whole lot to stand apart from the main series. I mean, what's the point in making a Spongebob spin-off if it literally has almost the exact same staff as the other currently airing Spongebob? They really couldn't be stretching the team any thinner. <laughs> yep, here we go. One of the weirdest decisions in SpongeBob history. That being giving Patrick Star his very own TV series. The Patrick Star Show. This is my show! In August of 2020, it was announced that we'd be receiving the second SpongeBob spin-off from Nick, this one starring a young Patrick Star, living in a house with his family. Mom, dad, grandfather, and sister, where he hosts a TV show to the public from his bedroom. This is genuinely, no exaggeration, one of the worst TV shows I have ever seen in my life. Every episode of the Patrick Star Show has the same setup, that being none. Things just happen in the series, and there's rarely any kind of consistent theme other than Patrick's show, which there's almost never any kind of plot or goal relating to it. He, he just does it, that's all. He, there's no, he doesn't want anything out of this. Well, why do it? The idea of him having a show literally just seems like some desperate attempt at doing something to make it stand apart from the other one. Episodes can have Patrick trying to get an ice cream from the ice cream truck, having a staring contest with his grandpa turning out into an all-out war, or traveling inside his couch to try and find the lost remote. It's literally just nonsense for the sake of nonsense. Now this was definitely an intentional decision, with even the writers saying they aimed a sideline story structure to free them up to be more surreal and randomly bizarre with the kinds of things they can put out there. Yes, that they, they literally said sideline story structure. Now, am I saying this couldn't work? Like, is it impossible to just make a wacky surrealist version of Spongebob where anything can fly? 
No, not exactly. Even if I do believe it simply shows a lack of understanding for what made the original so special. I mean, sure, the old SpongeBob had surrealist elements, but they were always grounded in some sense of structure, some sort of reality. There was a method to the madness, you know? But in a show like this where nothing matters, I find it hard to care about anything going on. Patrick lives in this peewee Herman-esque house where anything can happen. He has people living under his kitchen table, he can open a door and have it transport him to a dungeon. In a show where anything goes, it's impossible to be invested in this world of the characters. And despite all the insane stuff that happens in the series, it results in it being incredibly boring. Again though, this could have worked. If you're going to make a new show, then you might as well take a different approach and try something new. But I just wish they went further with it. There are times where I can see what they're trying to go for, with each episode being something completely new. But I think they should have entirely buckled down on this. For example, there are a couple times where we see this cool stop motion segment done by the same studio that did the Christmas and Halloween specials from a couple years back. And even this neat segment at the start of one of the episodes, featuring a Patrick robot in space. And that seems like the perfect idea for a surrealist Patrick show. Literally, have it be the Patrick Star show where he's trying to do something different in every episode. Have it be an actual show within the universe. I know, I don't just mean him standing outside his fucking bedroom window talking to the camera. How about have each episode be something completely different, something not seen before? Different setting, different story, but the same set of Spongebob characters to tie it all together. Just, I know how much I bitch about them, but literally just have it be an anthology show. It's still not what Spongebob is at its core, but it's at least something entirely new. Oh yeah, because then we wouldn't get introduced to all the cool new characters in this show. I'm gonna gloss over the fact that the original series had already established a different pair as Patrick's parents, and even had a full episode later on focused on his sister Sam, who's completely ignored here. Because again, it's Spongebob. Continuity is not the most important thing about the show. But these characters just have nothing going on about them. Patrick is definitely the one who received it the worst in terms of characterization. Although to be fair, that isn't exactly a problem exclusive to the Patrick Star show, it's something that's been happening in the main series too. Writing for a dumb guy must be really hard, because you have to be careful to keep some kind of balance, and make sure that you make it clear that them being dim doesn't equal them being brain dead. Patrick is brain dead. In the early seasons of Spongebob, Patrick is more so the guy who he turned to for advice. It was implied that he was a little less naive than him, and therefore Spongebob looked up to him, and the comedy came from the advice Patrick gave him, oftentimes being wrong or leading him into worse situations. You know, Patrick was still dumb, but there was a lot more to him than that. Again, there was like a method to the madness. Sadly though, as the show progressed, and especially in the Patrick show, this has been confused for him being brain dead. He can do or say anything he wants because <laughs> he's stupid. And I don't know if it's just me, but I just don't find that shit funny. I'm oftentimes just left sitting there like, okay, am I to be shocked by this? The dumb character didn't say something dumb. I, I, I couldn't have expected that. And for some fucking reason, they also decided to keep Spongebob, Squidward, and Plankton in this show. Why? If you're going to try and make 50,000 Spongebob spinoffs, why would you give them all largely the same cast? What is the purpose? Squidward is a beaver boy and Spongebob isn't a fry cook yet. Those are the only differences and other than that, they act the exact same as their main counterparts. I seriously don't understand the thought process here. Other than that, Patrick's mom and dad are just carbon copies of him. They're dumb and random. That's the character. His granddad is delusional and often annoyed by him, and his little sister is just fucking Sandy, who also appears in the show, I don't get it! One thing I would like to compliment the show on is the animation, although there are a couple things I'd like to note about it that I think overall is a big issue with the main show too. But on a technical level, yes, it is very impressive. In an era where TV grid 2D animation looks very low budget, Spongebob is consistently one of the most impressive ones I've seen, with how expressive it can be. And the backgrounds in this series are stellar, I really love the colours. But, I don't know, I feel like the new animation of Spongebob is a little too wacky. I know this is a controversial point to make and Twitter is going to have a fucking field day with it. Because I always see this being met with, But the animation of the old show was also expressive when off model too. You just, you just hit new Spongebob. But my point isn't in relation to them going off model, it's instead that I feel a result of them deciding to stretch these characters as much as they can makes the overall feel of the animation to be kind of weightless. Sure, the original did this, but it was very sparingly, and was only ever used to emphasize certain jokes or line deliveries. However, now it's all the fucking time, and because of that I feel like a lot of the slapstick doesn't work very well, because these characters come off like silly putty that can morph and bend any way they want. Sometimes, less is more. Again, the animation is very good, I just personally think it ruins a lot of the jokes they're trying to tell, and that's kind of an issue in a show where 99% of the humor comes from silly slapstick. Again, if I were to describe this show in any way, it's nonsense for the sake of nonsense. 
And I'm genuinely curious if anyone actually likes or laughs at this sort of stuff, because it definitely doesn't work for me. What I loved about the original Spongebob was how they could grind these more surreal elements. There were consistent rules that were followed, and because of that it was funny to see how far they'd go in trying to break them. The Nosferatu thing is funny because it completely comes out of nowhere and you weren't expecting it, but in a show where anything can happen and they're constantly telling those level of jokes, it just lessens the impact of all of them. But in a show where anything goes, in a show where anything can happen, it ironically makes it boring to watch because there are no consequences for these characters. So yeah, Spongebob spin-offs. Not off to a great start, are they? Maybe I'm just too cynical and pessimistic, but I seriously don't have any hope for the next batch of movies they have coming out. The only way I think they could work is if they focus on the characters that are the stars, and not have every other single Spongebob character present. Unless you want to do something like Tigger's first movie. Don't have it be a whole new spin-off, just have it focus on someone other than Spongebob. Have a movie in the universe of the original show, but simply focus on Squidward or Plankton, you know? And another big thing I'd recommend is to simply hire some new people to work on them. If you're seriously this hell-bent on expanding the Spongebob universe and want to do something new, then actually commit to it and do something new. Because having nearly the same staff working on each of these shows just causes them all to blend together and makes me wonder why they even bothered doing this in the first place. Okay, other than that reason. And with that, I'll leave it off there. I could have gone my whole life not watching these series and nothing would have been different. Boy, I sure am wasting my life here, aren't I?